liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waltman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waltman. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Wow. Holy cow. I just sound, I just finally heard the sound of my voice this morning. All right. Well, it's Friday, June 23rd, 2023. Time for another show. And yet uh, it doesn't sound that much like I'm ready for it. All right. Maybe I lower the, lower the volume just a little bit and get a little closer to the mic and just sort of take it easy. All right. Well, I really wasn't expecting this, but, uh, I don't, I don't know. I guess I wasn't talking out loud all that much. Uh, in the morning before the, the, the show ran. All right. Levels, Justice tells me, are five by five, as they say in radio land, I guess. And uh, voice, not so much. All right, Greg, you really did it to me. But I have things to share. And, well, we'll go as long as we can. So I guess, uh, Justice, you're on alert that, uh, who knows, at the top of the hour, it might just be uh, time to pull the plug and get off the air for the weekend. All right. We've got a lot to do. And a great desire to do it, even if not the voice necessarily to do so. Anyway, I got to start with this one. Uh, this was not, uh, you know, not what I was planning to do. Oh, I guess, first of all, I have to acknowledge uh, at the top of the, the show, it's now confirmed they've found the wreckage of the Titanic submersible. I think they refuse to call it a submarine. I don't know why. But at any rate, it's it was it was destroyed, as everyone thought, and... Uh, to, to no one's surprise, but many people's dismay, I suppose, uh, they were dead the whole time and, uh, we were horrible people for talking about it, but I don't know. It's just one of those bizarre incidents that, uh, the, the, the floor was wide open to discuss and, uh, probably will remain open to discuss still how crazy it is and, and whether or not this is a, a good idea to even, uh, have industries encouraging this kind of uh, adventure travel, as they, I think, euphemistically call it. But also, uh, yes, still all the uh, observations still valid that we were spending too much money searching for lost billionaires and not enough saving people at sea. And of course, um, it was also quite validly pointed out that in many cases it is considered illegal to go out in search of refugees who are either known to be in trouble or who are anticipated to be in trouble because you know that they're coming every day and they come in terrible conditions. So that's a very interesting thing to keep in mind, still valid, no matter what happened to this submersible thing. Uh, secondly, I guess, uh, well, just the, the question of... Um, uh, well, I, I thought the very interesting side question of the CEO of the company having purposefully sidestepped regulatory safety uh, requirements, etc., in order to uh, rush his product to market, essentially, saying that the safety precautions were all just about red tape and stifling innovation. But, uh, well, it's true he was stifled in the end, I suppose. At any rate, uh, the thing that caught my eye this morning, just before airtime, I figured you have to go with a headline like this one, from the Hill, uh, Boebert's, quote, frankly stupid impeachment push leads to gop groans and dem glee. And I figured I sound like I'm enjoying a lot of glee right now. I don't know. Uh, maybe that's what's going on. It's too much glee for me is, is uh, ruining my voice. But the quixotic push, remember that word? The quixotic push by Representative Lauren Boebert to impeach President Biden was placed on the back burner Thursday. But even some Republican insiders fear the damage might already have been done. Boebert, one of the fiercest among the GOPs, right-wing firebrands, surprised many of our colleagues by introducing an impeachment resolution earlier this week. The move caused disarray. The word is actually being used, disarray. Uh, in the House Republican conference, and the Fuhrer, not, not the... <laughs> the Fuhrer, but but it is does all come back to him, doesn't it? And the Fuhrer was only diffused with a deal to send the resolution for consideration by committees. And here, I just like to pause for a moment. The 
the piece about it that Greg brought to our attention yesterday from Punchbowl, I think. I think I repocketed that because of how odd it it struck me. But um, let me open that one up and take a look at it because, um, well, I guess really it's not actually necessary to, to refer all the way back to it. I guess they, they make a reference to it here. The fact that it was the deal that defused the thing was to send it to committee. I, I want to bring you back to earlier in the week when Lauren Boebert, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is just beating up on somebody who's just too dumb and it's unfair. But I mean, anyway, the point is that Lauren Boebert spent the earlier part of the week bragging not only that she was bringing the impeachment resolution, but that somehow that she had figured out some arcane loophole in the House rules that would allow her this week to force a vote on impeaching Biden. And she was going to bypass everything and jumpstart the process. And mine is designed so that it will get immediate attention, unlike the one from Murdery Trader Green, who she's in a feud with, by the way. You've probably seen some coverage there. And I guess they confronted one another on the House floor in the last couple of days uh, with uh, reportedly with Murdery Trader uh, leaning into Bobert's face and calling her a little bitch on the floor, which was really rather amazing and overheard by everyone. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't know what you want to make of that, but uh, you can have a great deal of fun with it, I'm sure. Uh, but at any rate, uh, her big brag was that unlike Murdery Trader Green's stupidly designed impeachment uh, resolution, which got relegated to committee. Hers was designed to totally kick ass and absolutely positively force a vote on directly on impeaching Biden this week. None of this BS Washington crap about da da da. Well, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that her, her resolution ended up being relegated to committee. But she says, if it stays there too long and they delay too long, well, she'll introduce the resolution again. And, you know, she'll be able to do the same thing again. And they'll once again uh, get rid of it again. Although this time they might decide to table it entirely because it's already in the hands of the committee and that won't undo any of the progress made to table a second offering of the resolution. The resolution is already in the hands of the of, of the committees. But I'll also point out, by the way, this has been referred to two committees, which is no kind of way to get your bill back on the floor super fast, by the way. I mean, one or the other of the committees can discharge it with no action if they agree to do so. But having it assigned to two committees means that there are two places where people who aren't on your team can bottle the thing up and keep it there forever and cause serious problems. You can bypass a lot of it by bringing it again as a privileged resolution, but and she threatens to do that, but it's also becoming clear that there aren't a whole lot of allies for her to actually get anything done with it and, and it'll just mean a series of embarrassments for her by bringing it to the floor. So I just I wanted to point out that she spent the beginning of the week saying, I know how this place works and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pull a stunt that's going to short circuit the whole place. And as almost is, is almost always the case, procedure wins. And you don't have to be any kind of procedural genius to beat this one. You just move that it be tabled or move that it be assigned to committee and see if you can get people to agree, yeah, this is not actually, you know, a well-founded complaint at this point. Plus, of course, there's turf issues, right? People on the Judiciary Committee are on the Judiciary Committee for Republicans, largely because they hope to be sitting in charge of conducting the investigation that would lead to the impeachment of Joe Biden, because that's what their fans want. And for Lauren Boebert to step in and say, I'd like this to be my work single-handedly and no one else gets to do anything cool, uh, they're not going to go for that. They're going to they're gonna encourage the rest of the conference to vote to refer it to committee. But anyway, I just thought that was 
uh, an interesting part of the story that isn't getting a great deal of attention. People have already forgotten that she was swearing up and down that at the beginning of the week she had the system beat. And then the system ate her for breakfast, which is the real story here. Okay, so back to the Hills story from this morning. Bobert, one of the fiercest among the GOPS right-wing firebrands, surprised many of her colleagues by introducing this resolution, right? And it caused disarray. And they also used the word furor, but not the right spelling. The move... Uh, oh, what move was it? It was uh, sending the resolution to consideration by committees. The move passed in a 219 to 208 vote on Thursday and places no obligation on the committees to do anything to advance Boebert's proposal. But she is insistent that if it becomes clear the gambit is solely about delay, she will bring up her resolution, quote, every day for the rest of my time here in Congress. She's practically daring everybody to throw her out of Congress, of course. Meanwhile, more moderate Republicans are wincing at what they consider an unforced political error that will give Democrats ammunition to attack the GOP as extreme and out of touch. Uh, if I were in their shoes, of course, I would be saying, those attacks are coming anyway. Disregard. So, you know, that might be what they think about this, but not all of them. Republican strategist Dan Judy, Dan Judy, well, okay, I don't think I know that person, but described the move as, quote, frankly stupid. So Dan, Judy, and Frank are all involved in this, uh, adding, the party needs to be focused on the problems facing Americans rather than this sideshow. Uh, by the way, three guesses at what sorts of problems Dan Judy thinks Americans are really facing. Probably Satan, abortion, and uh, war on Christmas. Anyway, most polls, to be sure, show American voters' main concerns, which is not to say that Dan Judy agrees, but most polls show that they are concerned mostly about the economy and inflation, as well as a host of other matters barely related to the effort to impeach the president. But that doesn't mean there will be an end to impeachment efforts, given that Representative Murdery Trader Green has her own efforts to impeach not only Biden, but Attorney General Merrick Garland, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, FBI Director Chris Wray, and Matthew Graves, the U.S. District Attorney for the District of Columbia. Adding to this week's spectacle, Boebert and Green got into a heated verbal exchange on the House floor on Wednesday. Several observers contend Green called Boebert a, quote, I got the quote right, little bitch. Green reportedly also accused Boebert of copying her on impeachment. You're copying me. <laughs> because it's a very adult conversation, as you can hear. Boebert, for her part, has shot back that she didn't want to get involved in, quote, middle school antics. Now, just all I want to do is impeach the president on something I heard on the radio. Democrats are agog at disputes like that, but also convinced that the politics of the matter will play to their advantage. Democratic strategist Mark Longabaugh, okay, declared himself amazed at the degree to which Republicans will figure out a way to self-destruct. He argued the specific danger was that performative efforts like a push to impeach Biden would turn off independent and moderate voters. While he acknowledged such voters have become fewer, as the United States has become more polarized, he contended that they are still a decisive part of winning any general election, and it's very, very clear, not like my voice, it's very, very clear that those moderate swing voters are just not interested in all these Republican shenanigans. Shenanigans, okay. This malarkey. Some Republicans shoot back that Democrats twice impeached then-President Trump, and they note that separate from those moves, some Democratic members made solo runs aimed at the same goal. Uh, yeah. So this, of course, firmly from the two wrongs make a right uh, school of governance, I guess. Representative Al Green of Texas last uh, or tried at least three times to impeach Trump, um, for example. And then uh, Representative Steve Cohen of Tennessee introduced five articles of impeachment against Trump in November of 2017 before the 45th president had even rung up a full year in office. Um I don't know. I mean, maybe they'll, they did do that, of course. And, uh, but then Trump did end up being impeached twice because he kept walking into 
the same traps over and over again. Anyway, uh, but Democrats note that such measures died swiftly and further contend that the MAGA wing of the GOP has a firmer grip on today's Republican Party than the progressive left has on congressional Democrats. They point not only to Boebert's impeachment effort, but to the mini uprising that stalled normal business in the House recently. After hard right members, including, of course, you have to get his name in here, Matt Gates, balked at the issues, including the compromises Speaker Kevin McCarthy had made on spending in order to win the a debt ceiling deal with Biden. Uh, poor use of the word win there, but okay. There is still the possibility that ultra-conservative unhappiness over those compromises could result in a government shutdown closer to the end of the year. It's not just the impeachment, but this whole pattern of things, says Democratic strategist Robert Shrum, finally someone I've heard of here. He included allegations of deep state malfeasance, as well as attacks even on some judges and investigators appointed by former President Trump as evidence of this pattern. Shrum added that any government shutdown would be catastrophic for the Republican Party. Rep Representative James McGovern, called out yesterday by Greg for specific praise, speaking in the House on Thursday, accused Republicans involved of, in bringing the impeachment resolution to the floor of dishonoring this House and dishonoring themselves. According to the Associated Press, McGovern added that the House had become a place where extreme, outlandish, and nutty issues get debated passionately, and important ones, not at all. You know, he's got he's right on point there. Even some Republicans who are uneasy with Boebert's actions argue that the political impact should not be exaggerated. They contend the episode might fade from voters' minds fast enough. But it's notable that the effort was seen as causing severe discomfort for the 18 House Republicans who represent districts won by Biden in the 2020 presidential election. And Boebert's push gives more fuel to the president's argument about the supposed extremism of ultra-MAGA Republicans, a label that was effectively used during last year's midterms. Still, there seems no chance of Boebert backing down, Last Congress, I watched my impeachment articles collect dust in Pelosi's office. She tweeted on Thursday afternoon, this Congress action had to be taken. Well, it was. And they were sent to committee and that was the end of it. So, I don't know. I found that an interesting and entertaining end to this particular chapter. If she brings them back to the floor as a privileged resolution again, uh, I imagine we'll just get more entertainment value out of it. But, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad that that uh, went the way of the, I don't know, of everything else, every other similar uh, effort. Uh, you know, I have another piece from The Hill from yesterday just describing exactly how it went down under the headline of Republicans punt on Boebert's effort to impeach Biden. Um, but I can't recall offhand whether there's any additional detail that we need to run through. They have the vote total here, but we got that from this story. Uh, that the sides, uh, it says, you know, the two sides of the question here ultimately reached an agreement late Wednesday to sidestep an impeachment vote by sending her articles to both the Judiciary and Homeland Security Committees, which have jurisdiction over impeachment and immigration policy, respectively. Remember, she's trying to impeach him over immigration policy. And I think the move to send it to Homeland Security is uh, I, I can only be viewed as an additional delay in a way of additionally burying the bill. They they, they don't need really to, to conduct uh, – if it were a serious impeachment effort, uh, the Homeland Security Committee, though, though he would be being impeached over Homeland Security issues, they just – they wouldn't handle the impeachment aspect of anything. They might – conduct an investigation and hand the results of their report over to the Judiciary Committee for them to process in the context of impeachment. But there wouldn't be um, concurrent uh, jurisdiction over the resolution. It doesn't make any sense except as a delaying tactic. So at any rate, um, yeah, she goes on to say that she's absolutely going to bring it back if she doesn't uh, get action. Uh, asked how much time she was willing to give the committee process before moving to force another vote. 
she said. The chairman is working on those details, adding that he's planned a few months of work and that there's a little bit of grace there. So, okay. So she's already contemplating a couple of months, which, fine. That means she won't be back with it next week. That means that probably carries us through the August recess and into September, at which point they'll say, you know, all the floor time has to be for appropriations bills. And it's likely that uh, even more time will be used up for regular appropriations bills between uh, October and January because of the second artificial deadline that they've built for themselves um, in insisting that they had to pass all 12 of the regular appropriations bills, even if they have a shut partial shutdown at some point between October and January, they still have to work to pass these bills, presumably still individually and no omnibus bills, although I think they'll break that promise in an instant, uh, possibly in an effort to avoid a shutdown, but certainly in an effort to end any shutdown. Uh, and then to avoid the January deadline they gave for themselves, which would trigger uh, spending cuts across the board if they fail in that mission. So I imagine there's lots of good reason to keep, um, well, certainly lots of good reason to keep an actual impeachment off the floor until at least the beginning of next year, at which point, of course, uh, they'll probably prevail on her to say, well, uh, this is an election year. Uh, we'll we'll impeach Biden at the ballot box and we'll see whether that holds with her or whether she may say, you know, I'd like to go into the election with this effort to run on because I'm so overwhelmingly popular in my district that I won by 530 something votes and this totally won't sink me. And then they'll say, well, you did say you were only going to do this for the rest of your time in Congress. So maybe we let you bring it to the floor once more. Um, uh, table it, and then, you know, we have the elections and then we're rid of you. So, you know, that's one strategy that they might adopt. We will see. Um, yeah, most of the rest of it is uh, standard commentary that I think was uh, pretty well covered and pretty well reflected in the first piece that we read, which, good, it gives us time to move on to a couple of other things. Why not read this piece of uh daily contemporary news that will take us to the break. Uh, I'll get a two-minute rest, and then we'll start uh, in on some of the older background stuff or things that have been waiting in the wings and uh, see if we can't fill the rest of the day with that. Greg Sargent notes for the record, bringing us back up to speed on this, that uh, John Eastman is before the uh, a board, a panel of the California Bar Association facing a disbarment action. I think I have a news piece on it from a couple of days ago and we just didn't get to it. But, uh, well, we always love the way Greg Sargent approaches these things. Trump coup plotter John Eastman is finally facing real accountability. That's good news. Former President Donald Trump and his supporters have blamed his indictment on a two-tiered justice system. As it happens, we do have a two-tiered system, but here's a better example of it. Hundreds of ordinary people have been convicted of attacking the Capitol on January 6th, yet not one member of Trump's inner circle of coup plotters has faced real accountability for it. That's why you should pay attention to the disbarment proceedings that lawyer John Eastman is facing in California. Eastman, who manufactured the bogus theory behind Trump's effort to overturn his 2020 election loss, could lose his law license, making him the first elite insurrectionist to pay a serious professional price for the coup attempt. Eastman faces 11 charges from the California State Bar, most concerning his lawyerly lies about election fraud. Importantly, the bar also accused Eastman of advising Vice President Mike Pence that a fabricated legal rationale empowered him to reverse or delay the presidential electoral count in Congress. No reasonable attorney with expertise in constitutional or election law would conclude that Pence was legally authorized to take the actions that respondent proposed, or rather, that respondent 
proposed. The bar states in its charges, it adds that Eastman knew these actions would violate the law and the Constitution. Eastman's the respondent here. They are looking to disbar him. They gave him a chance to respond. That makes him the respondent. If Eastman is disbarred for that charge, it would be genuinely novel. When fellow coup plotter Rudy Giuliani had his law license suspended in New York last year, it was for the conventional charge of making false statements as a lawyer. Eastman, by contrast, would be sanctioned for corrupting the law to try to subvert our constitutional order and help usurp the presidency. That would be a big wow, I think. You've heard of mob lawyers? Well, the Trump era has brought us the coup lawyer, which calls for a new kind of disciplinary response. The glaring need for this was driven home during Eastman's bar hearing this week. In a dramatic moment, lawyer Greg Jacob, who advised Pence to resist pressure from Trump to halt the electoral count, testified that Eastman's invented legal theory had inspired the January 6th rioters. The rioters had been duped into believing Pence had the power to reverse the election, as the House Committee on January 6th demonstrated. Trump had bombarded his followers with this message based on Eastman's theory. And as Jacob testified, this bore fruit when rioters stormed the Capitol, many apparently looking to intimidate Pence into doing what Eastman said he could do. As Jacob said, I thought that it brought our profession into disrepute. Given this, it's beyond absurd that people have been prosecuted for invading the Capitol, while none of the people who manufactured the legal basis for the false hope that motivated the invaders have faced accountability. Trump's coup plotters carried out all manner of other corrupt acts, yet none has faced serious professional discomfort, even. Not former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who pushed for Pence to execute the plot. Not Jeffrey Clark, who tried to get the Justice Department to fabricate a rationale for reversing Trump's loss. Almost as if he were attempting to weaponize government, one might say. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and we Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes, you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We decided to come back. <laughs> we'll try and finish. Uh, well, hell, we'll try and finish the whole show. But first, we'll try and finish Greg Sargent's writing about the Eastman disbarment proceedings. I believe we left off, uh, let's see, right about here when uh, he was just noting that nobody has faced any professional repercussions from the elite circle that drove the January 6th events. Trump himself might face prosecution over January 6th. That's, that's true. There's at least a special prosecutor there, but that's hardly guaranteed. Eastman might be the only one to face comeuppance, which is sobering, but... It would at least send the message that professional sanction awaits lawyerly abuses designed to reverse elections. True, disciplining lawyers over advice to clients is a tricky business. That is a good point. Eastman's defense is that his theory was based on a reading of history and the Constitution that's genuinely contested among scholars, but it strains credulity that Eastman really believed that. 
As legal expert Matthew Seligman has detailed, Eastman's theory rested on a tortured reading of constitutional history that essentially invented a vice presidential power to count electoral votes and is not a contested issue among scholars. Seligman was set to testify against Eastman as an expert witness, which should drive home his bad faith. Elite accountability in this country is at a crossroads. Many of the coup plotters have skated, and though Trump faces prosecution for hoarding classified documents, he might evade accountability for the insurrection. Tucker Carlson's propaganda about January 6th helped topple the cable host from his Fox News perch, but Elon Musk has created a safe space for his disinformation to continue. Dogged journalism has produced extraordinary revelations about corrupt Supreme Court justices, but Congress's refusal to place checks on them only reinforces the sense that our elites operate with impunity. Yet it's easy to lose sight of the fact that in some respects, our national response to January 6th was surprisingly robust. The House hearings on the insurrection dramatically illustrated its gravity. Many high-profile election-denying candidates lost in 2022. Prosecutions of January 6th rioters have proceeded apace. Congress passed strong protections against another January 6th by a wide bipartisan margin. If Eastman loses his law license expressly for abusing his professional stature to destroy our constitutional democracy, it would constitute yet another step, however small, in that direction. At the very least, it will send a message. Coup lawyering will no longer be tolerated, or at least not in California, I would have to add. Uh, okay, you know, well taken, and some excellent points made there. Just wanted to bring you up to speed on that news. Uh, working our way through what's in pocket, headed back towards some of the things that we've been held in reserve for a while. Uh, let's see. I know I've got this piece here, which I thought was our. This is not. This is just a uh, a note from Matthew Rigdon via Mastodon that I thought made a actually. You know, he was being funny, but it made a really strong point. Uh, the Hunter Biden stuff, which we've already forgotten about largely on this show. Uh, although I did see uh, in my rifling through the the Hills headlines today that uh, there's at least one story about supposed whistleblowers telling Republican members of Congress that uh, they heard that the IRS personnel ha involved in the case had actually uh, recommended felony charges on the tax counts and that only special treatment got them converted into misdemeanor counts and settled by back payment of of taxes in arrears. Although that does seem awfully familiar and it's the way most such cases are actually settled. So uh, it's a, also a likely possibility that the so-called whistleblowers are just Biden haters who happen to work at the IRS and... Uh, who suggested that they bring they bring felony charges and and the higher up said meh it really doesn't make any sense and they're blowing the whistle by telling Congress uh, we made that suggestion and nobody agreed with us that's not exactly whistle blowing but okay whatever anyway uh, Matthew uh, suggests here I wish the DOJ would have gone after Hunter on the gun charges. And that's an interesting thought. Why do we say, why would he say something like that? Because Hunter would then go to court over this law. Remember, this is, he's, the charge is that he lied on the forms that you have to fill out if you want to purchase a gun, attesting to your stature as a law abiding, um, uh, uh, wannabe gun owner, I guess. And, uh, I guess he failed to declare to them that he was a drug user, which he was. And, you know, it's never really a great idea to give guns to the, to the drug users. But I, I, I assume that most people uh, who are looking to buy guns and who may have drug use in their past or in, in their current lives probably are lying about that. But probably also have pretty good reason to have some guns around, like I could get killed by drug dealers. But... Eh, I mean, it's a good good reason for them. Uh, societally, it's not great. But at any rate, he's saying, I wish DOJ would go after Hunter on the gun issue because he would go to court over this and 
uh, claim that the Second Amendment stood in the way of his being prosecuted prosecuted for this. This was an unreasonable restriction on the right to keep and bear arms. And it would be awesome to see the NRA file a brief in Hunter's favor when he argues the Second Amendment makes laws criminalizing drug users who buy guns unconstitutional. And the temptation, I'm sure, would be sore on that side to do that. But uh, their gimmitarian side would likely prevail and they just wouldn't intervene as they had nothing to do to help uh, Philando Castile, right? When he was shot by police for uh, during a traffic stop for telling them that he had a gun and a license to carry it as well. And I guess that just didn't matter to them and uh, they were of no help. And so I imagine they would be of no help here to Hunter Biden either. But but a good observation nonetheless. All right, let's see. Another piece of news that we really should add to our background understanding of everything comes from Hugo Lowell of The Guardian, reporting from Washington. And this fills in the blank for those of us who have been watching the Trump documents um, investigation for you know, for as long as it's been going on, and wondering to ourselves, uh, how could they be so foolish as to not search Bedminster and every other Trump property for other hidden documents? And a lot of people who got a lot more excited about and a lot more exercised about things like that spent a lot more time than we did saying, uh, insisting to everybody... Yes, this is a terrible oversight. Uh, DOJ is awful. Merrick Garland is awful. They're just not prosecuting. They're looking to let him off the hook. They're not even looking. Anyone would know to look at Bedminster and other uh, properties where Trump spends time. So the news is essentially, yes, the DOJ knew that. And yes, they did look at Bedminster. And no, they didn't make a big deal out of it and announce it to everybody because What does that get them? They want to search the place and find out whether there's documents or get somebody to to attest to the fact that there are no documents. And then if they later find them, they'll hold that person liable and see if they'll flip on Trump. Yeah, they did it. Trump documents investigation examined New Jersey club from outset is the Guardian's headline. And uh, they're exclusively reporting. It says here in the subheader, the prosecutors developed evidence early on of classified documents at Trump's Bedminster Golf Club. Not only did they suspect it, as we thought they should, not only did they look as we thought they should, but they found stuff as we thought they would. So... More bad news for Donald Trump. Federal prosecutors investing Donald Trump's retention of national security material were examining evidence within weeks of the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago last year that he might have handled classified documents at his Bedminster Club in New Jersey, according to two people close to the matter. The indications of classified documents at Bedminster so alarmed prosecutors that they focused part of the investigation on whether Trump might have transported the materials or disclosed their contents there in addition to refusing to return them to the government, the people said. So right away, they basically figured whatever he's doing at Pervalago, he's also doing at Bedminster, and they sought to prove it. Trump was charged this month with retaining national defense information and obstruction of justice, in an indictment that also notably alleged that Trump discussed a military plan to attack Iran and waved a classified map of Afghanistan in front of a staffer in 2021 at the New Jersey property. And is that different than from the uh, waving the plan? I mean, they mention it in the same sentence, but I guess there's at least two instances, they think, in which he was demonstrating to staffers that he at least had classified information in his hand while they were at Bedminster. The suspicion that Trump traveled with classified documents between Mar-a-Lago, his winter residence, and Bedminster, his summer residence, started early in the criminal investigation that intensified after the FBI search and culminated in Trump being accused of violating the Espionage Act. A Justice Department spokesperson declined to comment as they've been declining to comment the whole time, and some people have interpreted that as meaning they're not doing anything, when what it means is they're not talking about anything. 
Within weeks of the FBI search of Mar-a-Lago, the Justice Department sought to act on the indications of classified documents at Bedminster when it told the Trump legal team that prosecutors believed the former president still possessed classified materials, the people said. The message in the letter, which became a formal court motion filed under seal weeks later, was clear. Arrange for new searches of all of the Trump properties because, as of that time, the only place that had been combed for classified documents was the Mar-a-Lago resort. Whether to acquiesce with the request split the Trump legal team. Trump in-house counsel Boris Epstein, he would, I think, be an immediate no, and, and he was a no, but this one surprised me. Uh, Chris Kyes also joined him in being uneasy about being ordered around by the government. Everyone's uneasy about that, but I thought Chris Kais was on the other side of that question. While the other Trump lawyers, Tim Parlatore and Jim Trusty, suggested a cooperative approach. And Trusty, uh, and I think maybe Parlatore too, have since bowed out of everything that they are involved in for Trump, as I understand it. Or they're seeking release by the court. It might not be up to them. The legal team ultimately decided on working with the Justice Department and in one exchange asked prosecutors which Trump properties and where on the properties they wanted them to search. The prosecutors were noncommittal and told the Trump legal team that they were not in the business of providing specific locations because they might not know about all of the properties in the former president's control. But... Notably, they did specifically request a new search of Bedminster. Bedminster had not previously been searched after Trump received a subpoena last May for any classified marked documents because it had been issued to the Trump political office, which is registered at Mar-a-Lago and a building in Palm Beach, not the golf club in New Jersey. The reason why the subpoena was issued to the Trump political office was not certain, though the Justice Department typically issues subpoenas to organizations because of the Fifth Amendment Act of Production Doctrine that protects individuals from being compelled to turn over contraband. But when the new searches of the Trump properties by contractors took place, they found no classified documents at Bedminster. My contractors found no documents. According to people familiar with what they certified to the then chief U.S. judge in Washington, Beryl Howell, who was overseeing the grand jury litigation. The results of the Bedminster search left prosecutors uneasy given the earlier evidence about indications of classified documents at the club, the people said, and prompted them to ask the Trump team for a custodian of records to attest that no further documents remained in Trump's possession, not just your contractors. It was when the Trump legal team declined to make a custodian available, principally because Trump did not have one, and suggested instead that Parlatore could testify to the grand jury about the new searches of the Trump properties. It was then that prosecutors sought contempt proceedings, the people said. The absence of classified documents at Bedminster led prosecutors to suspect that Trump treated it like a vacation home, where he took boxes of things away from Mar-a-Lago at the start of the summer and then returned with all of his things to Mar-a-Lago at the end of the season, the people said. Although it remains uncertain when exactly prosecutors learned about the audio tape of Trump discussing the military plan to attack Iran in July of 2021 at Bedminster, their suspicions were confirmed by March when the subpoenaed Trump aide Margot Martin, who made the recording to confirm, uh, or I guess, uh, by Margot Martin, when, uh, who's the one who made the recording to confirm its authenticity. Okay. So they've known for a while longer than we thought they knew, although we thought they should have known earlier, and it seems like we're, uh, like those two time periods mesh. At about the time when we were all saying, why aren't they checking out Bedminster? It turns out they, in fact, suspected that there was something at Bedminster, and uh, re they didn't execute an FBI search there, sure, but they got what I think they thought they needed. That is, 
they sought to get someone to certify and put their name to a document saying that they are, uh, that either there were no documents there or that they had searched and found none so that later on, if it turns out that there were some there, they could squeeze that person and say, you're going in for signing this document unless you flip and tell us what you know about how he was working when it comes to hiding documents while he was at Bedminster. And it looks like they already have that. So, okay, add that to our total understanding of the situation. And, uh, well, see if that clears anything up for you. Okay, uh, further back in pocket and also still waiting in the wings and some of the social media messages that I've got from regular listeners, lots of interesting things to add. Oh, here's something not interesting to add, just while I'm passing by. Uh, also from The Hill, because they aggressively market their material. Former GOP representative Will Hurd. Do you remember him? Have you ever heard of him? H-U-R-D, Hurd. Uh, I remember his face. I saw a picture of him. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. What was he all about? Uh, I don't know. But he's launched a 2024 presidential bid, which surprises me because what's he doing? But okay. Uh, former Representative Will Hurd of Texas on Thursday became the latest Republican to throw their hat in the ring for the GOP race for president. He made the announcement during an appearance on CBS Mornings, joining what has become a crowded field of GOP candidates. You know who's in it. Don't need to tell you that. Uh, what does it mean? It means he's filed some paperwork with the FEC. So that's great. He says, uh, well, he, he's he's taking the moderate lane. He's looking for the moderate Trump critic lane. Um, I don't know if that's open. Uh, he'll start at near zero and hover it around one. But uh, the trend for the others has been uh, run around and embarrass yourself, pretending that you're running for president for real and you can go up to five or six percent in a couple of weeks anyway just thought i'd add his name to the mix because it's there and uh you should know all right uh speaking of suggestions story ideas and directions suggested to us by listeners via social media i have this piece from uh let's see it's john shiflet's suggestion and what's the outlet here cronkite news um, which, though I, I assume is, is named for the trusted newsman, Walter Cronkite. I don't know anything other than the fact that, okay, they know who, who Cronkite was and, and figured that would be a good name, but they appear to have a story that it doesn't matter a great deal. I don't think what the slant, if any, might be. This is just straight ahead, practical reporting of something that I think we probably all anticipated, if we remember the story at all, would be the outcome. This is a pretty interesting um, uh, uh, opportunity to revisit something that seemed stupid and potentially disastrous at the time, and it turns out to have been stupid and potentially disastrous after all. But now we're going to get the details on just how disastrous it was and, and why it was so easy to predict that this would be a disaster. Arizona is our setting. Arizona's defunct border wall leaves trail of runaway costs, error-filled invoices, and questions about states, the state's oversight. What are we talking about? Arizona's defunct border wall. Border wall. Well, I remember that whole thing. There was a guy, he ran for president, and he was like, I'm going to build a wall along the border. Yeah, and it became a fence, but it was an impenetrable fence, except you could saw through it, and, and there's all sorts of dumb problems. And there's a picture illustrating this piece that reminds me, oh, yeah, I remember why we're talking about Arizona in this, in particular, because of this fence was going up all over the place in all the border, southern border states. And the photo that illustrates it is that we see this border fence, the Trump style border fence that's been erected here. And there's a rather sizable gap in the fence. No real explanation as to why there's such a gap in the fence. But the gap in the fence is plugged by stacked up shipping containers. I'm barely, you know, able to summon the memory of this. But, oh, yes, I recall that they were saying, 
that I, I didn't remember where it was, but I guess it's in Arizona that they said, well, the fence construction, A, it's expensive. B, it's taking a long time. There are holes in it here and there. Uh, what can we do to plug it? And I, for, as an emergency measure, someone came up with the idea of uh, under, and, and, and John makes this observation, file this under, you know, like, why don't you just ism that weird, terrible thing we don't have a better name for, but that we made up here on the show, uh, that philosophy of governance of, uh, don't think about things too much or the possible problems or repercussions. Why don't you just, we want to build a wall again uh, on the border. People are coming across the border uncontrolled. Why don't you just build a wall? Well, it's a huge, huge swath of territory. Uh, you can't build a wall that big and patrol the whole thing against breach. Well, why don't you, why don't you just uh, not patrol it against breach? Why don't you just build it unbreachable? Well, what does that even mean? I don't know. And, and, uh, why don't you just build, you know, a thousand miles worth of wall? Because <laughs> that's hard to do. And uh, there's ownership issues with the land and there's natural barriers and there's all sorts of things. All right, well, why don't you just, there's all these shipping containers. I don't know. Uh, let's just stack them up. You don't have to build wall. Just put uh, trucks and buses and shipping containers in the way. Well, as it turns out, uh, there are problems. And, and, and not all of them were immediately apparent. But if you stop and think or, or you read an article like this, you'll say, I think afterwards, oh, yeah. Yeah, now that I think about it, now that it's been done, of course that would present a problem. Well, what sorts of problems are there? The uh, subheader hints at some of these. Records show Arizona's defunct border wall cost twice the initial estimate, for one thing, and raises questions about the state's oversight of the controversial $194 million project. Our writers here are Alex Apple, Joshua Shimkus, and Francesca D'Annunzio, the names actually sound fairly familiar. Uh, looks like they're, um, they write for the, or, or, or are writing under the auspices of the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. It's listed in the byline, so I thought I'd say it. Here's the story. Just a few years ago, Arizona's Department of Emergency and Military Affairs, DEMA, as they call it, was counted among the state's smaller agencies, known for preparing Arizonans for summer monsoons. I didn't even know that. That changed in 2021 when then-Governor Doug Ducey declared a state of emergency over immigration and put DEMA in charge of what was to become a half a billion dollars to secure the state's border with Mexico. Nearly two-thirds of the money was intended for construction of a barrier at strategic points along the border. The solution the administration settled on was unusual. Shipping containers stacked one on top of the other and locked end to end. You'd think you'd have to lock them because otherwise what? You open the door and you go in one side and then you open the door on the other side and come out. I don't know. But apparently uh, if, the, if the doors are open, then it's not much of a barrier, right? It's just like a sideways tunnel into the United States. So shipping containers with locks on the end. And I'm sure that, you know, that was the end of the thought process for the why don't you just ists who said stack stuff up that's in the way. Not giving much thought to how high do you have to stack them? Can you climb over them? Can you get in the doors and just walk through, right? Or can you cut through the sides of these things? All right. Well, anyway, uh, that's what they decided to do. Nearly two thirds of the money was intended for this barrier. And it was going to be built out of empty shipping containers. Now, where you get them, well, how do you get them? How do you move them to the border? No thought given to any of that. Just put them there. Just, you know, click your heels and they'll appear. The sudden responsibility, though, strained Dima's small staff, according to legislative emails. And in September, Darlene, oh, what's this? Kihu, ki <laughs> Kiwis, I have no idea how you'd pronounce this. Q U I, Kui, maybe? H U I S. Kiwis, Kiwis, Kiwis. Oh boy. Sorry, Darlene. I hope your name doesn't come up that often in this. She is the department's assistant director, at, or was at the time anyway, and she told the governor's council on human trafficking that DEMA was unprepared to manage so much money. 
That's another sort of thing people don't really. The what about? Why don't you? Not what, not what aboutism, but why don't you justism is at play here. Different from gimitarianism, uh, slightly, but they, you know, it, it's interesting too that the people who uh, they're usually fiscal hawks as well. Why don't you just ists? And they often say when Democrats say, well, we have a problem in early childhood education. Let's double our spending on early childhood education to fix the problem. They say what? You can't just throw money at a problem. Uh, well, here they have a border problem, or they at least imagine they have a border problem. And what do they do? They just throw money at it. Well, we didn't just throw money at it. We threw shipping containers at it. But we threw money at DEMA and said, fix the problem. And as it turns out, DEMA also believes that you can't just throw money at a problem. What do you know? Well, anyway, uh, the DEMA folks, or uh, rather, I guess, Darlene here, the department's assistant director, comments, I can tell you how to repair a bridge, not how to lay a southern border wall and make it stay. She said, that's not what they do. Her words foreshadowed what was to come. The border wall that Dima oversaw did not stay and was not finished. It came down after the Ducey administration, faced with a federal lawsuit, agreed to remove it. Why don't you just, because it's illegal. Oh, well, why don't you just do it anyway and then make them come after you? Okay, they will. Okay, they won. Okay, I have to take it down. Okay, I will. Wow. Wow. In its wake, the wall left scars across the southern landscape and cost Arizona taxpayers nearly $200 million. We're not going to get to all the details about how and why before our break, but I'm always thankful for a short break. And uh, when we come back from the break, we will get to that information because it's all here in this article. Uh, boy, I hope the computer wakes back up in the next 15 seconds so that I can play the proper outro music and there will be uh, no discernible problem in the broadcast. Okay, here we are. So, uh, $200 million down the drain on this failed attempt at building a wall out of shipping containers, an investigation into the justification and contract for the wall by the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism, these folks, uncovered more than just taxpayer dollars down the drain. The investigation reviewed hundreds of pages of legislative records, payments on the Arizona Financial Transparency Portal, contracts and invoices. And guess what it found? It found a bunch of things summarized as bullet points, which you'll find interesting and exciting when you hear them next. All right, welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on ah, here on Illness Radio. <laughs> We're working our best to get through these. These are important stories and I'd like to share them with you. We'll just do it low key. All right, we left off reading this piece about the mostly forgotten and entirely failed Arizona state effort at building a border wall out of found junk, essentially, except they didn't find it. They paid for it. That's the big problem. So their investigation found, ready for the bullet points that we left off with, state officials used emergency powers to sign a no-bid contract. Always a big winner on the, on the, for the fiscal hawks. A no-bid contract to build that wall, circumventing competitive procurement laws, even though a barrier along the border was under construction for a year and could have been handled competitively. DEMA, second bullet point here, contracted with the builder before assessing in detail how much the wall would cost. The first hard figures didn't come until two months after the contract was signed, and they were Double Dima's preliminary estimate. Why don't you just, right? The Ducey administration's decision, bullet point number three, to build this wall on federal land over the federal government's objections also proved especially costly. The state paid the contractor millions of dollars to idle its equipment and workers during the legal standoff and other work stoppages records show. Why don't you just just build it? Just build it on the border. Well, a lot of that is federal land. Well, why don't the federal government build it? Well, they're running into problems of their own. Well, 
All right, then we'll build it. But again, you don't own the land. Well, why don't you just build on it anyway? Well, because you'll get sued, and what will end up happening is you have to stop work. And if you have a contract with a contractor that you're supposed to be paying to do this work uh, that doesn't say, yeah, if the federal government blocks us, then we don't have to pay you, then you're going to have to pay them to do nothing. And so they did. Gaps in the record and errors on some invoices also raised questions about DEMA's oversight of Ashbrit Incorporated, the Florida contractor that was ultimately paid $194.7 million to put the wall up and then take it down. How do you like that? Couldn't find anybody in Arizona. Why don't you just build a wall? Well, we can't find anyone in Arizona to actually do the work. Oh, well, why don't you just look outside to get, all right, we will, except they're going to double their <clears throat> costs and we're going to end up paying them to take the wall down anyhow. So who cares? DEMA officials corrected three different contract records after the Howard Center asked them about questionable entries or inconsistencies. For example, Ash Britt invoiced and the state paid, paid. Remember the plan here? We're going to put down storage shipping containers, right? And we're going to lock the doors on both ends so that people don't just walk through. Ashbrit invoiced and the state paid $7.37 million just for the locks, a material cost that had never exceeded $125,000 on previous invoices. But one of them showed up for $7 million and they paid it. Why? I don't know how many locks you're going to need for that many shipping containers. Damn, that could be true. They don't know. That's really amazing. <laughs> $7 million for locks. Well, I guess you didn't think about that, did you? Why don't you just build it out of shipping containers? Or they'll walk through the shipping containers. We'll lock the doors. Uh, all right, we need locks. How many locks? I don't know. $7 million worth of locks. Whoops. Oh, well. When Howard Center reporters questioned Dima about the expense months later, Judy Kioski, a little easier to pronounce that name, I think, or maybe I'm ruining it too, a Dima spokesperson wrote in an email that the description of locks was a typo and it should have read labor. <laughs> So it wasn't the locks that cost $7 million. It was the labor. They both begin with L. And so I guess you're just supposed to believe that. After communicating with Ash Britt about the change, Dima provided a corrected invoice to reporters. In another error, so maybe it's true. Maybe it really was labor and not locks. Although, you know, that's a hell of a typo. That doesn't come up a lot. Locks. In another error, an invoice referred to work done between 9 one September 1st, 2022, and 9-31-22, even though September has only 30 days. That's not so bad, but, you know, uh, it's an error nonetheless. DEMA officials also removed a $4 million entry from the state's transparency portal after reporters questioned why there was no supporting invoice for the payment. And that's interesting. Did you pay the $4 million? Yes. Do you have supporting documentation for why you paid it? No. So what are you going to do about it? I'm going to remove the document that shows that we paid $4 million. Are you going to get the $4 million back? No, I'm just removing the document so that nobody else accuses us of having paid $4 million for nothing. But you did pay $4 million for nothing. Yes, but I don't want any evidence of that. That was, that was the big solution. Why don't you just, ism, at work? Why don't you just remove the evidence and then you can't be accused of it, at least not credibly? Oh, that's a thought. Kioski said in an email, the payment was actually a duplicate that should not have been posted to the portal and that the Department of Administration is investigating how the error occurred. And the answer is stupidness. Okay. Gerardo Castillo, president of Ashbrit Management and Logistics, the Ashbrit division that built the wall, i.e. moved a bunch of bricks into position and piled them up and then took them away, declined all comment about the contract in a telephone call and referred questions to DEMA. 
Over the course of Howard said the Howard Center's months long investigation, Kioski ignored the center's requests for interviews and never spoke to reporters by phone or in person. Now, the political groundwork for the wall is laid out here. From the beginning to the end of the border wall saga, there were partisan divisions over the Ducey administration's claim that there even was an immigration crisis in southern Arizona. Ducey declared a state of emergency at the border in April of 2021, three months after President Biden took office, claiming that immigrants were overwhelming the resources of four border counties and two adjacent ones. None of the counties, Yuma, Pima, Santa Cruz, Cochise, if I have that pronunciation correct, we've done it before, Maricopa and Pinal, declared none of these counties, declared a state of emergency on their own prior to Ducey's declaration. They were right there. They could have done it. They didn't. Anti-immigration messaging was central to the campaigns of many Arizona Republican incumbents and office seekers in 2022. In the legislature, lawmakers put tax dollars behind the administration's emergency rhetoric with a whopping $544.2 million appropriation for, quote, border security in fiscal year 2023, almost as though they were utilizing the levers of government for political ends and weaponizing the state government. The administration's claims of a border crisis were also used to secure an emergency procurement authorization in May of 2022 that allowed the state to sign a sole source contract with Ash Britt to build the wall. But legislative records show that construction of a border wall was contemplated at least a year earlier. In 2021, the legislature passed, and Ducey signed, a law creating the Border Security Fund, seeding it with $55 million for DEMA. The act listed seven specific uses for the fund. Number five on that list was, quote, administering and managing the construction and maintenance of a physical border fence. Now, mind you, by the way, this all happens during the... Uh, uh, Biden administration, or at least the construction of this wall happens during the Biden administration after having four years of the Trump administration in which he promised that he was totally definitely going to build that thing and in fact had already done so. And he leaves office and suddenly Arizona is stuck saying we need to spend hundreds of millions of, of dollars building a wall. And nobody stops and says, what happened to the one that the other guy promised? Maybe this, these idiot Republicans keep promising a wall and can't deliver on it means something. But apparently that never occurs to anyone. David Blackledge, an attorney with Davis Miles McGuire Gardner, formerly developed contracts with the federal government. And he said that in his experience, that in his experience, a year appeared to have been enough time for a large contract such as the border wall to have been sourced competitively. State Senator John Kavanaugh, uh, spon a Republican, sponsored the appropriations bill to fund the shipping container wall in 2022. As a House member, in an interview with the Howard Center, Kavanaugh said he was not involved in the contracting process and was unaware the state intended to seek an emergency procurement authorization Kavanaugh said the idea for a wall made out of empty shipping containers came from the governor's office. He also said that his initial appropriation of $150 million for the wall was based on what he thought the state budget could deliver, not on how many miles of wall the money could buy. By the time the appropriations bill was sent to Ducey, GOP lawmakers increased the $150 million Kavanaugh initially proposed for the wall to $335 million. Not a single Democratic lawmaker voted for the bill. Ash Britt was the only company considered for the work, according to an email from Megan Rose, spokesperson for the Arizona Department of Administration, or DOA. <laughs> That's a telling uh, acronym. The state's contracting authority. DEMA was directed to expedite this activity for the protection of life and safety, Rose wrote. Rose said the state was impressed with Ash Britt's work in Texas, but she did not know what work in Texas made Ash Britt stand out. Texas contracted Ash Britt for help with the state's COVID-19 response in 2021, but not 
to build either of the state's temporary shipping container walls in El Paso and Eagle Pass, according to invoices obtained through an open records request. So they were doing this in Texas as well, except it wasn't Ash Britt, it was someone else. And who knows why this happened? Well, now the next section, the cost doubles. The DOA approved the emergency procurement authorization May 19th, 2022. The four-page document provided a bare-bones description of the project, saying that Ash Britt would survey the border area and close gaps with long shipping containers. The state estimated the cost of the project at $65 million. Ash Britt's contract with the state, signed two months later, did not reference that estimate or any other. While the contract included a pricing sheet for labor crews, equipment, and containers, the cost of the project depended on how many labor crews the company used, how many days they worked, and, crucially, how much wall they were to build. The first hard estimates of those costs didn't come until the end of July, two months after the contract was signed. A contract amendment, the first of six, detailed work in Yuma, Nogales, and Cochise counties. The cost? $123.6 million, almost twice the state's estimates four months earlier. Labor costs were the biggest single-line item. The initial contract said Ash Britt would deploy a minimum of three labor crews for the work. Each crew, plus equipment, cost nearly $100,000 a day according to the pricing sheet included in the contract. Instead of three crews, however, eight were to be deployed at two of the sites listed in the contract amendment. The amendment also revealed a glaring omission from the original contract. While Ash Britt's pricing sheet included a unit price for containers, it did not include pricing for transporting them. Each container measured 20 to 40 feet in length and weighed several tons. So the cost of moving so many to the border was bound to be high. It was. In the first contract amendment, Ash Britt calculated transportation costs alone at nearly $16 million, roughly four-fifths of the cost of the containers themselves. By the end of the project, when Ash Britt had transported the containers to the border, and then away again, transportation costs associated with the work amounted to $42 million, more than a fifth of the project's entire expense, according to invoices. Although really, whatever you're going to build the wall out of has to be transported there. They're not making wall right there. All right, next section, the wall goes up. Ash Britt's work began the first week of August in Yuma. The company estimated the cost at $6 million, according to the first invoice, but that figure increased to $10.25 million just three weeks later in the first contract amendment, which added more work. After Yuma, Ash Britt intended to put up containers in Nogales at a cost of $15 million, according to its contract, but shifted operations to Cochise County instead. The company never built any wall in Santa Cruz County, where Nogales is located, but build the state a total of $41.7 million for work around Nogales, according to the invoices. When asked about the Nogales expenses, Kioski said in an email that Nogales was used as a staging area for the shipping container wall and that the costs were related to that work. As Ash Britt worked, the standoff over the legality of the wall intensified between the Ducey and Biden administrations. When the legislature debated $335 million to be set aside for the border wall, GOP lawmakers repeatedly insisted that the wall would not be built on, fe- would not be built on federal land by mid-August. However, after the funds had been allocated and Ashbrit began work, Ducey signed an executive order directing the construction of the wall regardless of location. I'll just say it. Do it. The next day, work began to place containers on federal and tribal land. In mid-October, the Bureau, Federal Bureau of Reclamation asked the state to remove the containers Ash Britt put up in Yuma County because they had not been authorized to be built there. 
The Ducey administration sued the federal government a week later, arguing that the federal government did not have exclusive rights to decide what happened on the 60-foot-wide portion of land running along the U.S.-Mexico border. The dispute, along with protesters showing up at the border, caused stoppages in work, according to Ash Britt's documentation. But while the work stopped, payments to the company didn't. Contract amendments between the company and the state made provisions for Ashbrit to be paid if its workers were idle or had to be moved in and out of job sites during pauses. The first pause DEMA ordered came after the Biden administration's letter to the state requesting that the containers in Yuma be removed. The stoppage resulted in a $5.5 million payment to Ashbrit, most of it for standby time and moving work crews and equipment from the job site. Over the course of the contract, the state paid Ashbridge at least $33 million to move its workers from one place to another and to pay them a reduced rate when they were idle, according to invoices. Next up, a very expensive advertisement. Ash Britt continued to buy shipping containers and bill the state for the labor to put them up while the Ducey administration's lawsuit against the Biden administration was pending. On December 14th, the Biden administration filed suit to have the containers taken down, alleging Arizona was trespassing on federal land, which it was. The two sides reached an agreement on December 21st. Two days later, the state signed contract amendments with Ash Britt to take down the walls in Yuma and Cochise counties and to transport the containers to state-owned prison complexes less than 50 miles from the border. Taxpayers paid Ash Britt $64.3 million for the deconstruction work and to transport containers not yet used for the walls to the prisons, according to invoices. The transportation costs associated with moving the containers from the border were more than twice what Ash Britt charged to transport them in from ports in either California or Texas, according to the invoices, and they were only moving from the border to prison areas in state. Kioski, Dima's spoke, spokesperson, said in an email, costs for removing the containers were more expensive because, and sometimes these explanations are, are plausible, just interesting, uh, but then, you know, all part and parcel of why, why don't you just ism rarely works. But what's the reasoning here? It was more expensive because the transportation included movement from multiple locations, transporting containers to staging areas, placement, removal from staging areas, and movement to their current location for disposition with the Arizona Department of Administration. Okay. In the end, only about four to four and a half miles of wall were built, less than half of what was originally planned, at a cost of roughly 40 to $50 million per mile, including the cost to take the containers away. The half-mile section in Yuma stood for four months. The 3.7-mile Cochise section stood for less time. The project was not a total loss. The state now owns about... 2,100 shipping containers parked in southern Arizona, according to DEMA. The market value of used containers ranges from $2,000 to $4,000 each, depending on condition, according to multiple online retailers. Governor Katie Hobbs' administration has no definitive plans for them, but has suggested they might be converted into affordable housing. Hmm, I don't know. I mean, it's been done, but... Anyway, on February 7th, Ash Britt submitted its final invoice and fulfilled a contract stipulation that it credit an unspecified amount back to the state. The invoice totaled $20.5 million. The credit back to the state, $150,000. State Representative Athena Salmon, a Democrat from Tempe, a member of the House Appropriations Committee, told the Howard Center in an interview that the nearly $200 million spent on the wall could have been better spent on other needs, such as housing, health care, education. Unfortunately, all these crucial areas have just been ignored and neglected, she said. Instead, we just see money going towards pet projects and publicity stunts, just so that they can prove 
a political point. But Kavanaugh blamed the federal government for the money wasted on the project. Yeah, because it was spent by them. If they hadn't objected, we'd have bought a wall. We'd have more border wall than we need that we need than we have today since it was removed, the state senator said. Well, you know, why don't they just give you the New York Yankees and generate money from that? Because they can't. It doesn't belong to the, them to give to you. And federal land doesn't belong to you either. Kavanaugh said the wall's dismantling sent a message to the entire country that the federal government is not serious about border security, or at least not serious about spending $200 million on a stupid-looking temporary solution on federal land that doesn't even work and costs twice as much as they said it would. Pausing for a moment, he added, a very expensive advertisement. Okay, so that's it, I guess. I just thought that was an interesting... Uh, note for uh, our why don't you just ist files and I agree John thought so too uh, good background or information and a great crystalline example of why you actually have to know what you're doing and make a plan rather than just flinging boxes at whatever the border is and saying that'll do all right let's see we got a couple minutes here before our uh, next break, we might be able to use it here for, let's see. Uh, I wanted to go over to this story. I had an, another uh, newspaper source for this story, but you know, I read the story and it was intriguing because it was a story of yet another Republican sex scandal. And I thought, oh, that will be fun to share. And then I read the story and I said, I don't think I understand this sex scandal very well. And then I saw this piece on a diary on Daily Coast by Scorpio18, who writes under the headline, A Quick Explainer on the Unfolding Sex Drama in North Carolina, because that's where it's happening. And I thought, an explainer? Great. And then I thought, quick explainer? Even better. Let's see how it goes. You may have heard about this. I have, but you may not have unless you read it on your own. The lawsuit an alleged jilted husband filed against the North Carolina Speaker of the House. To provide a bit of context and background here, our writer tells us one, these lawsuits for alienation of affection and criminal conversation, I don't know what that is even, are known as heart balm torts. The term heart balm is used because these suits are supposed to provide some relief or balm for someone whose heart has been broken by the defendant who is being sued. Okay, I got gotcha. you. The suit is a civil action. The plaintiff is not suing for the return of his spouse. He is not suing to have the defendant jailed. He is suing for money. Alienation of affections refers to turning away or alienating the spouse's affections from the plaintiff. There does not have to be a romantic or sexual component of the alienating behavior. Many North Carolina cases involve defendants who are mother-in-laws. Yes, really, that mother-in-laws are being sued for alienation of affection. That's interesting. Criminal conversation is the civil term for sexual intercourse with one's spouse. Con have I read this? A criminal conversation. The civil term for sexual intercourse with one's spouse. That is someone else's sexual intercourse with your spouse. The criminal term is adultery. Okay. Interesting. To win the case for alienation, the plaintiff has to prove three things. That there was genuine love and affection existing between the plaintiff and their spouse. In the first place, I guess and that the defendant alienated that affection, and then, of course, caused for damages. So, to win the case for criminal con conversation, conversation, that is odd, the plaintiff has to prove the sexual intercourse, but that doesn't have to be photographic or eyewitness evidence. In North Carolina, it can be proved by opportunity and inclination. It looks like both were present in this case, uh, number seven in our list here. I'm well acquainted with the plaintiff's lawyers, the wife's lawyer, and the speaker's lawyer. They are all top-notch attorneys with excellent reputations and a good understanding of all the forces at play here. 
bring on the popcorn. Oh, okay, this is a, this is purely explainer. It doesn't actually give us the background story. So this might have been good to read after the uh, basic story, but now you know I could see it laying the groundwork for helping us unravel the story if we can read it after the break. So let's get through this. There's still two more or one more point here. Number eight, bonus factoid slash rumor involved in all this. Speaker Moore is the same fella, they say, who allegedly had a romantic relationship with former Democratic representative Tricia Cotham and got her to switch her party affiliation a few months ago, thus sinking the Dems' hopes of keeping North Carolina's 20-week abortion law in place. It's now changed to 12 weeks. I remember hearing about that. We don't know if we discussed it on the air, but yeah, there was a Democrat who flipped and switched parties and flipped their uh, 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 approval on uh, abortion ban. And uh, wow, I guess he did it romantically. How interesting. Uh, a little bit more about this and then the underlying story. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time just to tell you again another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROWX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let me uh, finish up with the explainer, which I'm reading ahead of the actual article about the scandal itself. Uh, so, yes, that is a, that, that last bonus factoid slash rumor is extremely interesting. Um, the list here concludes with the comment that what's really ironic and hilarious is that the North Carolina Family Law Bar has been trying to get rid of these heart bomb torts for years, and the General Assembly keeps slapping them down. I bet they wish they'd outlawed them now, huh? Probably true now that they're being brought to bear against members of the Assembly themselves. Okay, so what's the story here? The one I had put aside earlier from WSOC TV, um, from, oh, I guess maybe earlier in the week or end of last week, June 19th. Andrew McMillan for WSOC TV reporting this, a detailed lawsuit filed by a former Apex City councilman claims that North Carolina House Speaker Tim Moore, a Republican, of course, started an affair with his wife and engaged in group sex with other people seeking political favor. That's a new angle, the group sex part. Scott Riley Lassiter is suing Moore and an unnamed John Doe defendant for several claims, including alienation of affections and civil conspiracy. Channel 9, that's WSOC, I suppose, obtained the court documents, which alleged that Moore used his position as Speaker of the North Carolina House of Representatives to initiate contact and develop a personal relationship with Mrs. Lassiter, despite knowing that she was married to plaintiff. The suit says Lassiter's spouse worked in the state government, and that she had known the Republican speaker for years. Jamie Lyles Lassiter is currently the executive director of the North Carolina Conference of Clerks of Superior Court. The lawsuit says, 
Lassiter heard rumors that his wife was having an affair with Moore. On December 21st, 2022, Lassiter surveilled his wife after she said she was going to see a movie with a friend, and he found that she went to dinner with Moore at a steakhouse in Raleigh. The court documents say Lassiter found that his wife and Moore went to Moore's home in Raleigh and spent hours together. Lassiter says he believed that Moore and his wife had sex. You remember that the explainer told us you didn't have to definitively established that with eyewitness testimony you merely had to essentially say that they had the motive and opportunity uh, or you know some um, um analog to that in in north carolina civil law terminology the lawsuit included a picture of mrs lassiter and moore outside the raleigh steakhouse according to the lawsuit lassiter's wife allegedly admitted to the extramarital affair when she was confronted in the early morning hours of December 22nd. Merry Christmas, everyone. The lawsuit says Lassiter's wife confessed she'd been having the affair for three years and that, quote, she had engaged in sexual activity with defendant Tim Moore, including group sex with other individuals seeking Tim Moore's political favor. That's an interesting use of this person's services and that she feared ending the relationship with moore would result in losing her job not her marriage rather her job uh court documents say lassiter then asked to speak with moore to confront him about the affair on december 26th again christmas season uh back from the christmas break lassiter met with moore at a biscuitville restaurant in raleigh and moore admitted to having a multi-year sexual relationship with mrs lassiter just we're here at biscuitville i'm feeling charitable let me just tell you i've been having an affair with your wife for several years and by the way uh i've been able to broker excellent political deals by uh renting her out essentially in group sex encounters. How fun to learn that uh, at any time of year. But in the most wonderful time of year? I don't know. That would have been difficult. Uh, according to the lawsuit, Moore asked Lassiter at the end of the meeting if there was anything he could do for plaintiff, implying that he could use power that he held as speaker in some way to benefit plaintiff. So that that was something I've been Well, I'll tell you what. I'm sorry I've been having an affair with your wife, but maybe there's something you would like out of this. Um, I could do you a favor so that I could keep doing other people favors or getting favors from others by using your wife in group sex encounters. Could we work that out? I guess that didn't satisfy Mr. Lasseter, though. According to the lawsuit, the Lassiters tried therapeutic counseling, but ultimately decided to separate because Mrs. Lasseter couldn't end her relationship with Moore. That doesn't sound so great. The lawsuit also claims that an unnamed man installed a camera on Lassiter's property to record video. Lassiter claims that Moore, either personally or through an agent authorized to act on his behalf, requested that defendant John Doe unlawfully enter upon Lassiter's real property and place a motion activated camera to capture photos and videos of Lassiter that Moore could use to persuade Lassiter not to pursue any of the valid legal claims against him. Wow. Channel 9 has reached out to Moore's office for a comment on the lawsuit, but we haven't received a response yet. Moore's attorney did send a statement to WRAL in Raleigh saying that the claims were false. I look forward to meeting Mr. Lassiter in the courtroom. We are confident the speaker will be vindicated, Moore's attorney told WRAL. Lassiter's wife also sent a statement to WRAL saying that Moore isn't to blame. The claims are not only false, but impossible, as we've been separated with a signed separation document for years, she said to WRAL. Our marriage was a nightmare, and since I left him, it has gotten worse. We are reaching the end of our divorce process, and this is how he's lashing out. Lassiter is suing for over $200,000 in damages. Uh, so on the subject of the law itself, they offer this on alienation of affection. North Carolina is one of six states where this sort of suit can still be filed. This case in particular is quite fascinating. David Simmons, a senior attorney with Sodoma Law, said it's a interesting name for i don't know if they're a uh a divorce specialty firm or not 
Uh, but they've got Sodom right in the name, <laughs> Sodoma Law, I guess, S-O-D-O-M-A. Anyway, Sodoma Law isn't involved in Moore's case, but handles alienation of affection cases often. You would look to prove that you have a marriage with genuine love and affection, and maybe they didn't. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just a marriage with love and affection. The love and affection was destroyed, and it was destroyed because of the malicious acts of a third party. Simmons says that even if a separation document was signed, it doesn't necessarily change things. As far as proving the acts of a third party have caused that marriage to no longer exist, you're still going to have those questions, even if the separation agreement has been executed, he said. All right, maybe it's complicated, but thankfully uh, easier to understand this time around when I read it. Uh, last time I read it to myself off the air and I was a little bit baffled by it. But yeah, the explainer actually does help clarify things a little bit and then adds that juicy bit at the end that... Um, and there's a link, by the way, to that bonus factoid and rumor where Speaker Moore is the same fellow who allegedly had a romantic relationship with Democratic former Democratic Representative Tricia Cotham. Let's take a look at that. That uh, comes from Politics North Carolina under the title of It's Not the Sex by Thomas Mills. Well, maybe it was. Uh, that too from June 19th. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Thomas begins in his story. I thought North Carolina got rid of its alienation of affection law. I guess not, since a former Apex City Council member is suing State House Speaker Tim Moore for breaking up his marriage, and man, is it salacious. We've certainly heard plenty about it. While the details are juicy, the affair isn't the problem. It might be a headache, but not career-ending. Wow, okay. The GOP and his evangel its evangelical base have sanctioned paying hush money to porn stars, right? So, hell, the GOP base has been getting screwed by Republican leaders for years, and they keep asking for more, no pun intended. The simple affair with a married woman seems tame in comparison. No, the problem for Moore lies in the allegations that he had an affair with an at-will state employee, who believes she got preferential treatment because of the sex and was concerned that the speaker would take it out on her and her organization, the North Carolina Conference of Clerks of Superior Court, if she ended the affair. What would he take out on them? I don't know. The allegation also alleges that Moore and his paramour, Jamie Lyles Lassiter, had group sex with other people seeking favors from Moore. Trading sex for political favors could force Moore out. Moore has denied the allegations... And Lyles Lassiter says the couple's been separated for years. The jilted husband, Scott Lassiter, claims that the couple were living together until January of this year. His wife told WRAL, uh, no, not the case. And the same comment, uh, he's lashing out. All of this should be verifiable. Either they have a separation agreement or they don't, although the last attorney we heard from in the other article says that might not necessarily be determinative. They can't be nearing the end of a divorce if, as Scott Lasseter says, they separated on January 11th, because in North Carolina, couples have to be separated for a year before divorce proceedings can begin. It's hard to believe that attorneys would file a suit like that if they knew a separation agreement was in place. Lassiter is represented by former Wake County District Court Judge Kristen Ruth. Timing of the lawsuit is bad for Moore. He's in the middle of a budget negotiation and trying to get the legislature out of town. This lawsuit will certainly be a distraction, unless Lyles Lassiter can quickly prove that she and her husband have been separated for years, as she claims. Regardless, the week is off to a rough start for the Speaker. After Trisha Cotham switched parties... Rumors swirled that Moore and Cotham were involved in a more romantic relationship. Even if it was true, both were not married. I never believed she switched parties because of her relationship with Moore, though she does seem to be drawn to men in powerful political positions. I.e., Cotham married Jerry Meek when he was chair of the state Democratic Party, but I guess they're no longer married. These allegations, though, are much more serious if they're true. They, well, aren't all. Anyway, they claim an abuse of power in addition to alienation of affection. They also insinuate a pattern of trading sex for preferential treatment. The lawsuit says Moore had group sex with people seeking favors from him. Scott Lassiter and his attorneys will need to come up with somebody to corroborate those allegations. <laughs> but apparently 
<laughs> there are many because that was the nature of the transaction. So depending on how large the group was, it might not be so hard to find a corroborating witness. Okay, that's interesting. It is salacious. It's Friday. Time for salacia, if that's actually a word. And if it's not, it ought to be. It's a good one. Okay. Salacious material. Salacia. Right? It should work. Okay. Let's see. Other things to uh, uh, add to today's roundup. I, I'm going to go jump back over to the bird site, KITM hashtag, and look for what Patrick Snyder, and he's always left uh, trails of breadcrumbs to various uh, stories and threads that were of interest. Um, and there are several, and so it's become difficult to sort out which ones I thought I mean, they're all of interest, so maybe we go through a couple of them here. One, uh, and maybe this is relevant to what's going on right now, is just tagged with his comment of COVID is not gone. And it is connected to the thread from one Connor Brown, a bio-risk consultant specializing in COVID-19 business continuity forecasting and analysis. That sounds like an interesting angle on things. And... uh Hey, why not read it now in case what's bothering me turns out to be COVID? Hmm? I hope not. Anyway, no real reason to believe that it is, but risk, business, and the art of the possible. A thread, he begins, uh, and Patrick sends our way. I consider the unmitigated transmission of SARS-CoV-2, that's COVID, to be the single most important risk facing humanity. Uh, Really? Okay, yes, he considers some other ones. Climate change, of course, is a close second, he says. Don't get offended, climate change activists. I don't think this changes anything for you. Both of these are systemic risks. That is to say, they are risks that involve the breakdown of entire systems. And that's bad. That's true. I agree, right? However, and considering only the risk faced by COVID from this point, it is important to note that while unmitigated transmission is a systemic risk, just as bad in terms of how widely uh, diffuse the risk is when compared to climate change. It affects everybody in the, on the planet. So does climate change. That doesn't mean that one's worse than the other. It just means that's the, the nature of the risk, right? But it is also an individual risk. Infection is a significant risk to the health of the person infected. So COVID is both a systemic and an individual risk. Okay, that's a good point. I mean, people will die individually because of climate change. There is that too, but uh, I, I see the distinction. Mitigating the latter, the personal individual risk, involves personal NPIs, using masks, respirators, as he says, etc. Mitigating the former, the systemic risk, in the absence of high efficacy vaccines and or therapeutics will involve the adoption of societal level interventions. Okay, how so? Most obviously, the mass adoption of indoor air, air filtration, which, crucially, requires policy change from political institutions, right? If you're going to uh, change the way uh, indoor air is treated and managed in every building in America or around the world, for that matter, it's going to be an enormously costly undertaking and one that's going to have to be made mandatory in order to guarantee that everybody participates in it. That means policy change at the top levels, right? Good point. Can't see it happening, but good point. Which in turn means, and this is vital, that people like me, him, Connor Brown, have to be able to sell the policy. This involves convincing political and business leaders of the value of investing significant amounts of money. Investment requires a demonstration of return. That is to say that not only can environments like schools and restaurants be made considerably safer, but also that this increased safety will lead to medium-term cost savings or even profit. The entire argument for improving indoor air quality is based on making the indoors like the outdoors in terms of the risk of viral transmission, not eliminated but significantly reduced. That 
is the art of the possible. This process, convincing policymakers to effect political change through institutions, is currently the only route we have to mitigate the systemic risk posed by COVID, SARS-CoV-2 as he refers to it, of course. Remember, at this point, it is impossible to eliminate this systemic risk. It can only be significantly reduced. My point Risks intersect in unexpected ways. Insisting on respirator wearing everywhere, outside and inside, which is an excellent mitigation of individual risk, also diminishes the core argument for improving indoor air quality and for mitigating systemic risk. So that's an interesting interplay all by itself. Also, Much as SARS-CoV-2 is a highly significant individual risk, it is obviously not the only individual risk any given person may face in their life. My feeling is that we, the COVID cautious, are in this for the long haul. And a general and compassionate recognition of these unpalatable facts is necessary. Why? Because we form the core of the pressure group that will continue to push for mitigation of systemic risk. If we fracture, that itself is a significant risk because it means systemic risk mitigation is less likely to occur. So I implore you, think strategically, compassionately, and pragmatically going forward. It's an interesting and complex thread. I'm not certain to worry, we have unpacked it all here. But an excellent point and a reminder, you know, just once again, that this is a policy choice here, right? We could make it easier for people to mitigate indoor air quality by subsidizing the cost of it, by mandating it and or, you know, in combination with subsidy or just outright paying for it with federal grant programs. Uh, the, The medium term return here being, yes, a huge outlay of federal, state, whatever, governmental funds to mitigate indoor air quality, but the upside being we return to normal commerce and are able to sustain normal commerce. And apparently that, you know, that part of the the economy itself is extraordinarily important to us. Otherwise, we just say the costs of running the economy are borne um, individually to those of you who are, uh, who fall ill from COVID once, twice, three times, 10 times, who knows how long it's going to be. Uh, And or the uh, uh, companies or other entities who attempt to mitigate their indoor air quality on their own um, and perhaps face competitive pressure from others who say, if we reach the conclusion societally that, hey, there's nothing you can do about COVID and the vaccines work pretty well and it's mostly not killing people. So we're just going to have COVID like the flu. People are going to get COVID all the time. Uh, They'll have some downtime. They'll get over it. Um, Well, one, I'm not certain what the impact of the economy is on that if it's still happening at large scales. But uh, why would you pay to mitigate your indoor air quality if your competitor doesn't and can therefore theoretically, you know, under economic theory, offer lower prices for their goods and services than you, their competitor, who has to pay for the indoor air mitigation? In reality, of course, the other folks will simply, I mean, it's just as bad. They'll have better profit margins than you do. It's just as bad in terms of competitiveness competitiveness as between the two of you. But there's no cost savings to consumers for not mitigating the air quality over at Walmart while local uh, place uh, decides they want to do so uh, for the health of their employees or any other reason. Or vice versa, for that matter, if Walmart is able to use its market power to do it at a lower cost and mom and pop are not. Anyway, uh, you get the idea. But it's interesting that there are these two um, layers of risk mitigation uh, at at play here. And then somebody else, though, makes a very excellent point. I want to throw this in there as uh, someone responds to the thread. Um, It is, uh uh-oh, Schwarmir, Schwarmiri, (laughs) with one at the end, S-C-H-W-A-R-M-E-R, E-I, and then the number one. I don't know who the person is, but uh, they make this excellent point. 
um, uh, to Connor Brown's point, one thing I've found useful in improving indoor air quality, like if you're actually thinking, I'd like to do something about this at home or nearby or whatever, one thing that's useful for improving indoor air quality via HIPAA filtration is to address, uh, or I guess is to, to mention that HIPAA filtration addresses issues beyond virus transmission, right? We got purifiers into classrooms in a community full of anti-vaxxers and COVID deniers, wherever this person lives, because they do worry about uh, VOCs, which I'm not certain you know, I know exactly what we're talking about, but the rest of it I know, mold, brush fire smoke, etc. right? With the big forest fires or brush fires that were, were uh, 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 damaging the air quality all over the East Coast, right? And have, and that, uh, traditionally annually do so in the West Coast and mountain regions as well. But yeah, mold and, uh, various other, uh, contaminants, et cetera. It's not just COVID-19 that's mitigated by indoor air quality and filtration. Other things that even anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers believe in and worry about can likewise be mitigated that way. So an excellent point. Sell it to them another way. All right. I thought that was uh, very interesting and uh, a different direction for today. Uh, let's see. And there's a couple of other ones too. But uh, just, uh, I think, a quick, well, I don't know. That thread doesn't look that quick anymore. But I'll point out, because uh, we're on the subject of what Patrick Snyder wants us to know before the weekend. And... That is, uh, this one comes as no surprise, but here it is, an interesting parallel, as he says, to Trump's documents indictment, though this is more egregious. Are all equal under the law? We'll see. This is the thread from Jose Paglieri, the Daily Beast political investigative reporter, who writes, at this very moment, a federal judge in Missouri is sentencing a former FBI intelligence analyst for taking home 20 classified documents a prosecutor in this case is now on special counsel jack smith's team targeting former president trump that is an issue of interest kendra kingsbury worked at the fbi's kansas city field office where she worked on different squads drug trafficking violent crime violent gangs and counterintelligence at 48 last year she was indicted on two counts there are some parallels to the trump case Feds say Kingsbury took national security info about Al-Qaeda in Africa, including an apparent Osama bin Laden associate, and activities of terrorists in related groups. FBI employees in court just now, uh, when he was reporting on it live the other day on the 21st, says agents found stuff in her home office next to a bathroom. Sound familiar? Here's some of what the FBI agents say they found in Kingsbury's possession. They also found cracked CDs in a trash can, some 386 classified documents. This list, by the way, there's a screenshot of it here, is nowhere near as long as the ones that the FBI found at Mar-a-Lago. So uh, a number of obviously classified and troublesome documents listed here. In four searches, FBI agents found 20,000 sensitive digital and paper documents taken by Kingsbury, most of which were not classified. They were for official use only or law enforcement sensitive. She voluntarily disclosed this, but was dismissed. She kept her security clearance, by the way. I'm tuning in now to the sentencing, Jose writes. <clears throat> pardon me, back on the 21st, which is being held before Judge Stephen Bow at the county, uh, federal, I'm uh, sorry, federal courthouse in Kansas City. An FBI employee is describing what Kingsbury did. Kingsbury worked in counterintelligence from September of 2013 through the fall of 2017. She faces 10 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. The indictment is attached here. At some point, she turned in her personal computer and asked them to destroy it. Government employees punched a hole through it. Feds later wished they'd searched it. Uh-huh. We don't know what's on that computer. There'd be reason to suspect there could be additional documents on that computer. Why did they do this? Kingsbury later said that she may have had a top secret document at home, soaked it in water, tore it up, flushed it down the drain. The FBI says that's not how it's supposed to be done. Hmm. 
Where have we heard this before? Flushing it down the toilet. FBI thought she might be in contact with case subjects and found it odd that she took these docs home. Feds cite how she asked a co-worker to wipe another laptop after it started acting wonky after she ran into a Russian national at Disneyland. That does sound suspicious. While investigating her, the FBI grabbed her phone records and found she communicated with seven suspects, including counter-terror targets. It was very concerning to us, said the agents in court. That's where it departs from the Trump case. The feds are hinting at a sinister plot here. Although, I don't know that it departs all that much, actually. Uh, like the story, the story we read the other day that's getting a little more renewed attention from the New York Review of Books, I thought put things nicely. Anyway, after talking to a counterterrorism subject being investigated by another field office, she searched for that person in a secure FBI database, even though she was never assigned to that case. She really is conducting espionage here. When questioned, she lied about it. She claimed that she occasionally did research that crossed over into work that was being done by other squads. It would only take a second or two to tell this counterterrorism subject they're under investigation. Could have been jeopardized the entire case. But the FBI agent testifying in court says they never figured out why she was in contact with those people. He makes clear that the evidence is damning and the activity was potentially damaging. Keep in mind this FBI employee or ex-FBI employee is being charged solely with two counts of violation of 18 U.S. Code Section 793E, willful retention of national defense information. By contrast, Trump faces 31 counts of this same crime. Remember that when the judge announces her sentence shortly. Also relevant, Trump is facing a whole lot more, including obstruction of justice, uh, conspiracy, and lying to the feds. Kingsbury's publicly funded federal defender notes that she voluntarily disclosed her classified records collection uh, permitted four searches and kept updating the feds as she found more docs, whereas Trump, of course, refused to work with NARA, etc. Prosecutors are recommending imprisoning her for 57 months, just shy of five years. They cite the gravity of the situation because she kept them in an insecure space in her home. Anyone who was in her home could have stumbled upon those documents. The thread goes on for some time. I'll provide it to you to read the rest. But now it's time for me to provide you with access to Justice Putnam From coming up next Radio. on com. the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. You have been listening to K Grow in the Morning with David Walton. It is, of course, Justice Putnam who provides you with access to Justice Putnam. But here's what he's got for you. A common player in the recent Supreme Court scandals exposes a broader project to manipulate the court. I bet you know what that's about and who's at stake here. Leonard Leo, right? On the rest of the menu, an Iowa meteorologist resigned after an 18-year career citing threats over climate change coverage. Wow. See you next week.